Hi, everyone, and welcome. It's both an honor and a pleasure to introduce my dear friend and colleague, Diane Lilo Martin, Board of Trustees, Distinguished Professor in the Linguistics Department at the University of Connecticut. <clears throat> She's also an LSA fellow. We've known each other now for about 30 years, and I still remember the first time we met several decades ago. Diane is a model of how to live the life of a linguist doing all of it, the whole package. That means building a connection with the community in which she works, in this case, the deaf community, recruiting participants for her research, collecting, analyzing, annotating data, and building theoretical links with the important debates of the day. In Diane's case, syntax and semantics. A few relevant background facts about Diane are that she received her doctorate from UCSD in 1986, mentored by Ed Klima and Ursula Belugi, the emperor and empress of the field of sign language linguistics. After graduating, she headed east to the University of Connecticut, and she has been there since then building one of the strongest centers for sign language research in the United States. Diane's work has a strong formal approach. And since the beginning, the main target of her research has been language universals. She says, and this is quoting a bit from her lab page, linguistic universals are a fascinating component of linguistic research. Most of what we call universal comes from studying spoken languages but sign languages must be considered as well in order to have a complete picture of the true universal properties of language. In some cases, sign languages show the effects of proposed linguistic universals, but there are also differences between spoken and sign languages that must be taken seriously. <clears throat> Diane primarily focuses on the question of language universals using evidence from sign language acquisition and compares sign language data with that coming from acquisition in spoken languages. In Diane's case, that meant spending lots of time with toddlers, sometimes even dressing up in a funny giant bunny suit, and then thinking about these child data in light of the most pressing syntactic debates of the time in terms of language universals. Some of the results that she obtained from, a young, uh, from young children acquiring ASL as a first language were reported in her first book, Universal Grammar and American Sign Language, Setting the Nulp Argument Parameters. This book is a milestone in shedding light on which version of the current account of ProDrop was correct. Her results still hold up, and one of her first papers from the same year as her dissertation, Two Kinds of Null Arguments in American Sign Language, is still essential reading for anyone entering the field. Universals also figure prominently in her 2006 book, co-authored with Wendy Sandler, called Sign Language and Linguistic Universals. Recently, Diane's work has turned to bilingualism in children. And here, too, there's been a strong theoretical focus. We'll learn more about this in a few minutes. In monomodal bilinguals, that is, people who learn two spoken languages or two sign languages, the channel itself limits how much of one language can be articulated along with another. After all, we can't speak full sentences of Chinese and English at the same time. Hypothetically, this is not the case with bimodal bilinguals, people who have command of two languages but one of them being signed and one of them being a spoken language. So hypothetically, it would be possible to produce a grammar of a sign language on the hands and produce a grammar of a particular spoken language using the vocal apparatus. Diane's work asks just how much of this is actually possible. Her results speak to the question of how independent or how linked the two languages are in their neural networks for formulation and for processing. This is a great theoretical question, and it has practical consequences, too. When I say that Diane is the whole package, it's because she chooses questions like this one 
of bimodal bilinguals with an eye towards their theoretical interest and with an eye towards possible impacts that they might have on deaf children's lives. The bimodal bilinguals that Diane studies, hearing children with deaf parents, could and probably should be the comparison group for deaf children who have cochlear implants. Cochlear implanted children, too, have the potential to be bilingual. And in order to assess how developmentally similar children are with cochlear implants and children with deaf parents who are hearing and learning one language signed and one language that's spoken is important. And it requires careful research on bilinguals and particularly bimodal bilinguals as Diane is doing. Diane has had numerous grants from the National Institutes of Health to study these and other issues concerning language acquisition. As if that isn't enough, she is now investing some of her efforts to make all of her data and the data from other labs available for future students and colleagues. This type of work is tedious, but entirely necessary if we support a larger number of young scholars working on sign languages. Tagged and publicly available corpora will allow sign language linguistics to be integrated into linguistic analyses more broadly. To this end, Diane is working with myself and other colleagues to construct the Sign and Gesture Archive at the University of Chicago. But as a person, Diane is also the whole package. She's done a lot of service in her career. She served on numerous NIH and NSF review panels. She's an associate editor for the journal language and has supervised and continues to supervise more than 20 PhD students, both deaf and hearing. And probably most importantly, she is outspoken in her efforts to be inclusive in all aspects of academic life and to pave the way for an ever larger number of deaf academics, particularly in linguistics. Besides that, she's always had a kind word to say to everyone and about everyone. And she's just about the most humble person I know. So without further ado, I turn the floor over to Diane Lamartin, whose talk today is entitled, Tap Your Head and Rub Your Tummy. <laughs> Wow. Thank you so much, Diane, for that very generous introduction. I'm so tremendously honored. Thank you. Also, I want to thank the LSA, the program committee, for inviting me to give this keynote presentation this evening. I'm really looking forward to sharing some of the work that I've been doing with all of you. I might need to explain to some of you who don't know me that I'm hearing actually, and sign language is not my first language. But why am I signing right now? Well, I have benefited tremendously from my involvement in the deaf community, and they have permitted me to research and discuss and discover so much about sign language and sign language structure, how deaf children acquire sign languages, and now how people who have acquired both sign language and spoken languages use them. So for my presentation tonight, I would like to present in sign language so that I can have direct communication with my deaf academic peers. So Diane has already mentioned my interest and my enthusiasm to learn more about what is going on with the phenomenon of two languages that can be produced at the same time. Perhaps many of you might think that that's an impossibility. You can't have two language utterances at co-occurring simultaneously, but it is actually true and it is possible if you have two different modalities. If you have a sign language and a spoken language, you can express two different utterances at the same time. 
So I'm going to show you some short examples of this kind of co-occurrence. There are captions on the video. On the top caption, top line, you'll see a gloss of the signs being used. And on the second line, there's going to be an actual English translation. So you can see what is actually being said, uh, what is going to, what is spoken. What you might notice is where there's a sign and how much of what is said is also corresponds to what is signed. Sometimes there might not be an equivalent one-to-one -one match or mapping to what is signed or is and being spoken. There might be some divergence there. Um, sorry. Between me and Sylvester. Uh, Sylvester sees monkey <laughs> or writer. So what's happening there is that she's talking and signing at the same time. We refer to that as code blending. And this means that there's some pieces of the sentence or the utterance that overlaps with each other. Some of the signing and some of the spoken language are compatible. That label, code blending, is actually was first coined by Karen Emery and her associates, who did a lot of research on psycholinguistics and sociolinguistic structures for that kind of linguistic phenomenon. So I'm using her terminology. Thank you so much for your pioneering efforts there. So who does this kind of speech and signing simultaneous production? People who grow up signing and also use spoken language at the same time, they are usually hearing people who have deaf parents. They are referred to in the community as CODAs, children of deaf adults. They are then now endowed with two modes of communication and referred to as bilingual bimodals. So what's important to note about code blending is it is not equivalent or it's not the same thing as SIMCOM, simultaneous communication. That SIMCOMing actually prioritizes spoken language and is tend to be used in other contexts, usually in some kind of educational context where hearing adults are trying to teach English to deaf children and reinforce the spoken language. Code blending is quite different from SimCom. It's much more compatible with the, com with the idea of code switching. People who are bilingual and who are able to then use both languages with other people who are bilingual with the same two languages. <laughs> So I'm focusing on code blending, and I'm not going to be talking about SimCom during my presentation. It's a fascinating linguistic phenomenon that I'm very eager to learn more about. What is going on here? Is this a processing task? How does the mind work when somebody is engaged with code blending? Are there constraints? Perhaps. There are some constraints. There are linguistic constraints, or maybe there are some processing constraints that affect the production of someone who is code blending. It is very challenging to produce utterances in two languages at the same time. Perhaps it's a performance reason that lends itself to having more constraints with this kind of production. It might be trying to do something like this. Maybe that's what it is. It's hard, right? It's hard to tap your head and rub your tummy at the same time. If you can do that, 
maybe it's constraints for code blending too are applicable here in terms of just the physical movements, right? Now, I assume, yes, that there are some processing constraints for engaging in code blending, and I want to learn more about what those are, as well as possible linguistic constraints that might be evident. Mm -hmm. So the basic question that I'm trying to learn more about is if you have these two languages being uttered at the same time, how complex can these utterances become? Is this only effective with small, uh, with shorter utterances, or can these, uh, can our sentences become more complex? Is it because of the differences between the two languages? These are all variables I really wanted to explore. So this question was actually proposed during a project that I've been involved in for about 10 years now. It's related to how children developed two languages at the same time, how they develop bilingualism. And this project is, um, I'm working with collaborators, Deborah Penn Pilker from Gallaudet University and also Ronisi Quadros from Brazil. There are also many other people who have contributed to this project. All of their names and their photos are on the slide in front of you. I want to thank also the NIH for their financial support for this endeavor. So this project actually involves studying people who have been exposed to both spoken and sign language at the same time as they're having two L1s. So we include CODAs, K-O-D-H, kids of deaf adults, young children who have deaf parents in the United States. And also, Deaf children who have deaf parents who grow up signing and who also have cochlear implants for developing speech capabilities. So we're comparing these two groups, as Diane Brentari mentioned, and their language development. We're also including a group in Brazil what we can also compare cross-linguistically. So I'm going to just briefly mention one part of that study right now. So our research question, our goal, is that we'd like to know more about how each language is developed in terms of their spoken language capabilities, sign language fluency, how they're developed separately. And at the same time, we also want to learn more about which language is used in which particular contexts, language choice. We're also really motivated to learn more about how these two languages interact with each other. Mm -hmm. And we know from children who are bilingual that there can be some effects from one language onto another and have some sort of structural influence on how they produce one language based on their knowledge of the other language. So we're wondering whether or not this would be applicable in the bilingual bimodal population. One example is we studied children who were developing their uh, ability to use WH questions. For spoken language, both Portuguese, Brazilian Portuguese, and also with English, the WH part of the question is usually at the beginning of the statement. It's fronted. With ASL and also Libras, the sign language of Brazil, 
They have a similar structure, but the WH component can also be put in other aspects of the utterance. Mm -hmm. It can be in the final position. It can be doubled at the fronted and the final position. Mm -hmm. So we're wondering whether or not children might be borrowing, so to speak, these structures from their sign language input and having it influence on, have it be influenced on their spoken language output. And yes, we found evidence of children, usually under the age of three, do allow sign-based structures in their spoken language output. And, and they formulate WH questions, they'll use the doubling, or they'll use the WH component in the final part of the utterance. I don't actually consider that problematic. I think this means that they, or that they have any sort of frustration with their bilingualism. It's just a natural influence of being bilingual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This kind of influence is usually referred to as cross-linguistic influence or some kind of transference. Mm-hmm. So when we notice children doing that, We want to understand what are the cognitive mechanisms or structures that are beyond that. So the group that we were studying We developed a model based on this, the language synthesis model, where we try to explain this kind of bi-directional influence Mm -hmm. on the children's language development. So there can be some very abstract components from one language that are going to then influence the other. And then the derivation there and the output would have all stemming from one place. And I think one important assumption from this model is that there's one derivation, Mm -hmm. which means that we don't assume that there's a separate mechanism for for the derivation of sign language and the derivation of spoken language. They're all converging and being derived from one central place. So as we're developing this model, for explaining this influence of the languages on each other, we can also use this for code switching. But we actually also noticed that children were using code blending as well. Mm-hmm. And we wanted to see a little bit more about how their use of code blending might be compatible with the model that we're developing. And the, with the first step is we analyzed their code blending output. On with, This is some previous research mm-hmm. that w- was based on content mm-hmm. and categorizing which language provided more of the content in the utterance. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to show you some examples on the subsequent slides here. The first category is what I call code blending full, which means that all of the content is present and provided in both modalities, signed and spoken language. Mm -hmm. So what the child is signing and what the child is saying provides the content is the same same content. Mm -hmm. Here's an example. Where's mommy and daddy? At work. At work? Daddy, work. What is mommy? Daddy. Daddy work? Mommy work. Oh. (laughs) Yeah. And you can see that even though he's less, not barely two, he is able to combine both languages in one utterance. 
The next category is I'm showing you where the sign language has more information and the spoken language has less so, less content being presented. So again, he's still combining parts of each language to produce one statement. But there's more information being presented in the sign language component. And now we can also have the opposite, where there's more information being presented in speech than in sign. I'm a doctor. I want to dump right now. <laughs> and the last category is I refer to as complementary, which means that there's some information in sign that's not present in speech and the other information that's presented in speech that's not being signed, and you need both elements from both modalities to comprise and understand the full sentence and full statement. Um, mommy. So obviously that's intriguing to really find out how children are able to combine two languages like that. We started really trying to figure out what are the constraints that are present here. And we looked into each structure to see what was the order in terms of what was spoken and what was signed. If the signs and speech matched and were mapped, in terms of word order, we refer to that as congruence or being congruent. Mm -hmm. If the word order did not match or was not mapped, we referred to that as non-congruent. Mm -hmm. And it didn't matter which modality presented more information, whether it was in the same order or reverse order, it was still referred to as being non-congruent if there wasn't that mapping. Mm -hmm. So we analyzed the code lending statements that were produced by this boy, Ben, between his ages of when he was two and two and a half, as well as the adults who interacted with him. And we did find that he had a very strong preference for congruence. Mm -hmm. Both children and adults almost never produced incongruent or non-congruent statements. Mm -hmm. And now with incongruency, there are also different categorizations as well. Mm -hmm. We can see when both the child and the adult tended to prefer having a f had a full accepted the grammaticality of the statement, whether it was signed or whether it was spoken. Mm -hmm. But we also had some adults who used English completely and the ASL pieces were lacking. And this is where the child tend to have the opposite response, where they tend to have the spoken language components missing, but maybe we're fully signing. Now remember though, that Ben is only two and children tend to not have grammaticality in their statements anyway, missing components of English. So whatever he was missing was actually on par with what you'd find in the other typically developing two-year-old children. Now, with this study, we actually tweaked the model slightly. We wanted to show that you could actually have one derivation, but have output in two different modalities. So the model 
shows that you can have this double simultaneous output with contributions from two different languages, which then are now being output into output into two different modalities. Mm -hmm. Now, not all researchers agreed with this perspective. We have a team in Italy, Branchini and Donati, and they actually study CODA children in Italy. Their population was slightly older. So they are learning spoken Italian as well as Italian sign language. So those researchers observed basically two different kinds of code blending. The first category, they claim that one language was leading the derivation and that all the information on all the grammatical elements were actually being having being contributed from one derivation would, would then be branched out into two different modalities, whether it was spoken Italian or Italian sign language, one of them would be dominant. The second category was full sentences that were completely grammatical and all the information was being presented in one language as well as the other at the same time, two separate derivations. And their argument was that there must be fully, two fully separate derivations for this phenomenon to happen. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. I really want to focus on the example of from type two, the lower rectangle. And that shows that we have a full WH question in Italian sign language with inspoken plus Italian sign language having the WH question at the end. In spoken Italian, the WH is at the beginning, but here we see that being reversed. And the researchers claim that that is because there are two separate derivations happening. Now, we don't have any examples like that from our original data, but our data are from two-year-olds. Mm -hmm. So it's possible that we just need more complex structures to study with adult speakers. And then we might be presented with other kinds of evidence. Mm -hmm. So we need more information for sure. Mm -hmm. So now we're studying this phenomenon with adults to see what kind of complex structures they produce And these is with these, this is with adult CODAs. Mm -hmm. Again, working with a variety of collaborators, and I want to thank all of them for their contributions as well as the funding that we've received from the National Science Foundation. With this study, again, we were comparing participants in the United States as well as in Brazil. But actually now we're focusing on the United States population. The participants include, are from three different groups, demographics. Those who have sign language as their L1, they grew up with signing in their home. They not necessarily have the same first language as other people in their community. And they're considered heritage signers. Mm 
heritage language users, which means that they can expect considerable variability in their fluency. And we do want to include the, the this group as part of our study. High levels of fluency as well, people who are sign language interpreters. The second group would be people who also have a high level of fluency, but they are not functioning interpreters. And the third group are people who are not necessarily as fluent uh, weaker signers. With the procedure, we gave participants a variety of tasks, and I'm going to summarize some of the results from two in particular. The first one is an acceptability judgment task. The participant watches a video on a laptop. They know the person is also a CODA. They have that sense of similarity with them. They see the code uh, sign and say something at the same time. And the participant makes a judgment about whether or not that utterance is acceptable to them. I will show you the, the stimulus. And there's also captions for all of you. Not for the participants. Just so you know, the captioning is for the purposes of this presentation. Please eat your dinner. Very simple sentence. And then they were, the participants would score whether or not it wasn't acceptable, whether or not it was moderately acceptable, or whether it was truly acceptable, number three. So that's what the accessibility access acceptably judgment task. The other task was an elicited production task. We wanted to try to elicit the part statements, more complex statements from the participants. And we did this by having the participants and the experimenter look at slides on a laptop that presented a short story in sequence. There was another experimenter who was sitting on the opposite side of the table who couldn't see what the participant and the other experimenter were looking at, but they instead had a stack of cards. I will show you those in a moment. So I'll give you an example of what one of the stories looked like. All right. The last picture was this. And then the participant was shown this final slide with four smaller pictures on them, one highlighted green. Mm -hmm. And the task was that they needed to explain the story to the other experimenter enough of the stories so that the other experimenter could select from their set of cards the right picture. So the other experimenter had the same picture without the highlight. So we were trying to elicit code blending structures from our participants. So we use a variety of structures. We really wanted to try to really elicit more complex and more different kinds of statements and code blending utterances to try to see where the constraints lie. I'll review each type. But I do want to mention the last one, the fillers. Fillers should actually have scored considerably low. And we did that intentionally. Fillers were scored low, which is exactly what we wanted to show as a basis of comparison. Mm -hmm. 
So with our first category, we refer to as co-insertion. So suppose someone has a spoken utterance and just one sign is used. That one sign might be congruent or have some sort of translational equivalent and is only used once. Or you might have the reverse of that where you have a signed utterance with the co-insertion of one spoken word. And what we expected, generally, this should be fine because previous research showed that people do this quite frequently. But what we found is that some sentences were scored generally well, while others were scored relatively low. We found this very intriguing. What is the difference? And we went back and looked at our materials again, and we actually found something very interesting. The scores were hired, higher if the sign, if there was focus, if there was emphasis on the sign and spoken co-insertion. If something was signed and then only one word was spoken, then the scores were rated much lower if that word was not emphasized. For the signed utterance where only one word was spoken, it was typically scored pretty well. But we found that with the last group, there wasn't focus and that we didn't have a sentence like that. Our tests weren't designed for that purpose. Mm-hmm which means we need to really include those kind of sentences and those kind of statements in future tests, and we predict that that would actually end up being scored low as well. With the other categories, we found that most participants would be following one structure or another, either signed or spoken, and that's considerably common where that was scored relatively high and produced more frequently. In the elicited production task, that was quite common. If we had the reverse, where there was an order inversion, where two words were signed and perhaps inverted, that was scored still relatively well. People found that acceptable. But in the production task, no one actually produced that themselves. Now, what we found really interesting and complex was with causatives, Mm -hmm. causative structure. If the English and the ASL followed the same transitive structure for causatives, Mm -hmm. those were scored well. And also in the elicited production task. But sign sentences are usually used the intransitive Mm -hmm. verb form. The intransitive is more often used than in spoken language where we have, we see the transitive more frequently. So if you're trying to then simultaneously produce both languages in both modalities at the same time, both these varying structures, this did not score high. Mm -hmm. 
And this was also not produced in the elicited production task. Mm -hmm. With passives, it's a little bit of a different story. English, we see passive quite frequently. In ASL, we don't, it, it basically seems that like ASL does not have a passive voice. It's where we move the object to be part of the topic of the statement. And now with English passive plus ASL object being moved to the front of the statement, what happens there? It's considered rather acceptable and scored high. We also see this produced in the elicited production task. I'll show you an example. The man's wallet was stolen. Okay. But if you use the passive in English plus an active SVO, subject verb object structure in American Sign Language, means that should that be the same similar? But it was scored quite low. I'll show you an example. The dog was bought by a family. Wow. <laughs> oh my. Okay. So if you know sign language, it's funny, right? And that's the reaction I expected you to have. It means, okay, it's a little bit challenging, right? Because it, it, it's not, it's a little bit of a mental gymnastics, right? Because it's not really possible to say both sentences at the same time. The last category is idioms. So if we have an English idiom that is then signed, word for word, like a word for word translation, like shooting the breeze, <laughs> okay, right? And if you know sign language, it's funny. Those are scored relatively low. But if you have a meaning-based translation where with an English idiom, that was scored well, scored high. That was acceptable. So what do we really find here, right? Quite similar to previous research that we know code blending is possible. It's a very common phenomenon to be able to produce utterances if you're bimodal at the same time. Now, but what about practice? Can you actually improve this ability if you practice? Now, we actually didn't really see a considerable difference amongst these three groups of people. We basically found very similar responses amongst the three of them. The third group had some ASL knowledge, but it was relatively rudimentary. And in terms of production, we found basically the same occurrences, but our research is ongoing. Now we're wondering if there are any linguistics constraints here. Now clearly there are. There are linguistics constraints at play here. Coinsertion has some linguistics constraints. We're talking about focus, emphasis, a preference for congruent structures, mm -hmm. congruency, but there's still some leeway where one modality might be more dominant than the other or might prior be prioritized. We can have both languages being contributed to the same utterance with an understanding that there are some constraints to the structure mm -hmm. and not all structures from both languages would be permitted with this type of phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Now we're comparing our results to the Italian study. 
And we really don't see for our data the need for full separate derivations. Now, maybe because of the structure of Italian, spoken Italian and Italian sign language, there might be different properties there that might give rise to the seeing the dual derivation, but we don't see that in our study of American sign language in English. It's something, not something we observed. We're seeing that we're following that same structure for spoken language and sign language for ASL and English. And it is also possible that both languages are contributing to have equal amounts of information in the same utterance. And this is really similar to some previous studies with WH question and the influence on both modalities and both languages. So our conclusion is very similar to this famous quote from Francois Grosjean, that the bilingual is not two monolinguals in one person. No, that the whole is definitely more than the sum of its parts and the phenomenon is considerably more complicated. We know that there are different kinds of bilingual phenomenon like cross-linguistic influence, code switching, code blending, and all of them are requiring certain sort of linguistic faculties and cognitive processing. We want to learn more about that. And we also know with code blending, it means that there are two languages interacting with each other in very complex ways that are also at the same time governed by rules and structured. And finally, I would like to thank all members of the deaf community who have been involved with our research, CODAs, kids and adult CODAs. Also want to thank other collaborators, research assistants, everyone who's been working on all of these projects and all of our funding sources as well. Lastly, I'd like to thank all of you members of the LSA. Thank you so much. Yeah, very well done. Oh my God, you guys were like the perfect perfect. Good job. Are there questions? Do I have time for questions? What are we, is there a moderator? Someone facilitating time? <laughs> Hello? I guess we're just kind of on our own here. Um, Perhaps if there's a question, you can line up at the microphone that we have over here for questions. Please, if you could. That's great. We're going to sort out the interpreting as well. Take off your badge. Excuse me. Well, thank you so much. I love that. I wish I could deliver an entire lecture of that quality in sign language. Then the interpreting thank was you. beautiful. It's fascinating talk. I bet you know what I'm going to ask you. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what you're going to say. I wonder if there, if you, uh, maybe the next step is to look at prosody. And the, the reason I asked was simply because of watching the one example of the uh, the man purse ba wallet stole. Yes. Uh huh. <laughs> yes. Because the in the example was passive, mm -hmm. and the the there was a kind of a offhand uh, let let deaccent deaccenting I would say of the word steal in the case of a passive when the when the subject wasn't the age when the yeah. The subject was not the agent since it was a passive. And I would, I would expect more, uh, stress on steel if it was an, a an active sentence. And I wonder if, if that's correct. Thank you so much. I'm going to stand right here. Okay. So thank you so much, Wendy. Yes. Um,
we have we are starting to pay attention to prosody more and we are including that element in some of our analyses. Um I skipped over that piece, but analyzing that one example, we calculated that for English we have the object, the passive object that was moved to the subject and it became the topic of the sentence. And that topic also match the topic in ASL. So both have prosodic elements for the topic, for that same topic, even though in English it's the subject and in ASL it was the object, but it functioned as the topic in both utterances and prosody is what informed us of that. Also, we analyzed prosody for several other, like, coinsertion, several other elements. Examples where we really see the importance of prosody and that of the effect on our understanding. The problem is that we don't necessarily have this one-to-one -one correspondence for speech and sign language there might be sort of a hold as we sort of catch up on one modality and so we switch to the other modality and we allow there's some flexibility there. Now for the acceptability judgment task, it was really important that the model, the way the person signed, had to look really smooth and the person also practiced. I mean, it was uh, a lot of effort to just really try to make these statements as sort of prosodically neutral, let's say. But prosody, yes, is a very important element. Thank you for mentioning it. Yes. I'm uh, Bill Samarin from the University of Toronto, formerly of California, Berkeley. Uh, I'd like you to comment on the bilingual is not two monolinguals in one person. Because I was thinking, and I learned from your talk this evening, that we might have an insight into the creation of new languages by pigeonization. So what does your, or what do you think your work contributes to the study of bilingualism and in our field of creolistics and pigeonistics? to the, the creation of new languages? Well, we have a lot of people who are in the field of sign language linguistics who are studying emerging sign languages around the world. There are several people who are here, actually, in this audience who are working on that topic. They might be better able to answer that question than I am, but I'll throw my... Uh, Throw my, my two cents out there. Um, my concept of two languages being able to have easy access, let's say. Yes, it's very possible to actually have more than two. You can have parts of languages from, you can have many different sources contributing to this one singular derivation. And now remember with the model that I presented, it's a considerably abstract model for a person. It's not necessarily applicable to a community, but I do think that if a person has this kind of, let's say, mental structure, this cognitive structure at play, and perhaps others in the community or at a community level might also share this tendency to express themselves with a sort of mixed language use. And then that becomes part of a community and then that kind of usage then spreads. And then we develop a community of users. So we're possibly going to be seeing more of this as we study emerging signing communities. I would allow, I would prefer to uh, defer to those who are studying emerging sign languages to lead that discussion. Okay. Hi, uh, Diane, thank you for that terrific talk. 
Um, I'd like to follow up a little bit on Wendy's question about prosody, uh, in part because uh, we do have the two modalities, and there's a lot of work on co-speech gesture that says that co-speech gestures typically occur with the prominent word of a phrase. The, in this case, would be the focused word of the phrase, and it feels off if it um, if it's too misaligned. And so when one goes ahead to think about prosody in this context, it may be that not only could there be constraints that have to do with each of the languages individually and their prosody, but also as they fit together, they may come up with sort of in, um, interface constraints with respect to the two prosodic systems that you're dealing with. And um, in bilinguals of all kinds, even monomodal bilinguals, Chinese speakers who uh, learn a prosodic system but have a tone system in their L1s, the pr prosodic systems of bilinguals have to adjust in an independent way from the rest of the grammar and the rest of the phonology. So it's a complex but fascinating question. Thank you. That was more of a, of a comment than a question, but I wondered if you thought about that. <laughs> Thank you, Diane. Well, I haven't actually looked into that in, in much detail, but I do want to mention, as you know, and other knows, Karen Emery and her work and her model is based more on performance and also shows more what is done with spoken language and how signing and code blending is very similar to that kind of situation that you just mentioned. And I think that we can really capitalize on this idea to see where gesture, co-speech gesture, in many ways parallels the experience of code blending, not completely because code blending involves another language compared to co-speech gesture. Last question. Okay, so I'll make mine really quick. Um, uh, I was wondering, um, in sign language, do you have uh, like gender agreement uh, between um, like a, a, a verb and um, like the noun in which you're conjugating? And and if that is uh, present, I don't know anything about sign language. So, um, so if someone is producing um, utterances in sign language, and at the same time doing the code blending, um, like doing the utterance uh, in spoken language and the spoken language does have this, uh, for example, gender, like a, if it's the gendered language, um, would, is that a possibility to test? Thank you for mentioning that. In sign language, there isn't gender agreement in terms of verbs. Oh, am I? Oh, you're good. Okay. If everyone can see me, sorry about that. Sorry that my back was to you before. Um, so in sign language, we don't have, in American sign language, we don't have gender agreement with verbs. But what we do have is spatial agreement. So that is one possibility, you know, one part of the analysis. My colleagues in Brazil actually are working on Portuguese, Brazilian Portuguese, and Brazilian Sign Language, and Brazilian Portuguese does have gender agreement, and they have that included in their study. Gender for noun phrases. But sign language doesn't express that. So that is a component of their study. We... I don't have results from their research yet. Now, in terms of spatial agreement that is present in American Sign Language, and let's see how to phrase this. So we didn't actually test that specifically, but we do see when signs are, let's say, full or leading, 
there's, it's the leading structure in the code blend, we'll see that kind of agreement in terms of space in, and, and in the verbs. So we have something like that, but the omission sometimes, mm, the Italian group, for example, they mention specifically that sometimes they do have some examples where their the agreement is missing if the sign language, the Italian sign language is leading. And then we see evidence of that happening uh, in the reverse as well. If you have any other further questions, please feel free to stop me in the hall or throughout this conference. Thank you so much.